Innovation in medicine is racing forward at tremendous speed. But healthcare on a global scale is improving at a much slower pace. What's the future? Next generation computers will comb medical databases, tracking down the most effective personalized therapies. But will it be limited to the industrialized world? How can the human right of access to healthcare be implemented at a price that we can afford? From fighting disease to preventing it. Obesity and high blood pressure, diabetes and cancer. Diseases of affluence are on the rise in the developing world and in industrializing countries. Better education can help save lives. Raising awareness for what makes you sick and how to stay healthy at every age. Good leadership will be key to establishing healthcare systems that really work. Governments, scientists, and aid organizations have to work together efficiently, turning evidence into policy across borders. Vast global challenges. Access to clean drinking water. Enough food for a growing world. Climate change that threatens the health and very lives of millions all over the globe. Health is the starting point. Without it, there can be no escape from poverty. Challenges and opportunities. Providing health care worldwide. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. This little movie introduced the challenges and the opportunities of global health. Scientific research is making enormous and rapid progress, but the people most in need are not reached by this progress, at least not the way we would like it to be. The burden of disease actually is increasing, not only in the poor and low and middle income regions, but also in the rich areas of this world. We cannot and we do not want to accept this as a fact. We have a responsibility to improve this situation, and this is the ambitious goal of the World Health Summit. During the next two days, we'll talk about research and innovation. We'll talk about education and leadership. We talk about the question how evidence can be translated into policy. And we'll talk about global health and sustainable development in the countries. The World Health Summit intends to conclude with recommendations uh, to policymakers around the world. I welcome you to the World Health Summit 2013 in Berlin. My name is Detlef Ganten. I'm here from Berlin, from the Charité. And I'm co-chairing this uh, World Health Summit 2013 with my good friend and colleague, John Wong. And may I ask you, John, to come up to the stage. Thank you, Professor Gensen. And it's uh, my great pleasure to co-chair this World Health Summit opening ceremony with Professor Ganten. We are delighted to be here again in Berlin with more than 1,000 key opinion leaders from the various parts of society from over 50 countries from around the world. With ministers, ambassadors from the M8 Alliance and other countries, excellencies and members of parliament, I am delighted that the host of our summit 
the Federal Minister for Foreign Affairs for Germany, um, His Excellency Guido Westerwelle, will give the honor of addressing us shortly. We also welcome with great pleasure the President of the European Commission, Excellency Jose Manuel Barroso, the Federal Minister for Health, Excellency Daniel Barr, Professor Günther Stock, President of the Berlin Brandenburg Academy of Sciences and Humanities, and of ALIA, the Federation of All European Academies. The 2004 Nobel Laureate, Professor Aaron Kikhanova, Director of the Cancer and Vascular Biology Research Center, Technion Israel Institute of Technology, and Mr. Christopher Vierbacher, the, the Chief Executive Officer of Sanofi. To all of you, it is with our great pleasure to welcome you to this opening ceremony. And now I'd like to call on my good friend and colleague, the Dean of the Medical Faculty of the Charité, Professor Annette Gutes, as the next speaker. Annette, please. Excellencies, honored guests, dear colleagues, dear friends. In my function as the Dean of the Charité, it's my privilege and pleasure to welcome you on behalf of the Charité and as well of the M8 Alliance to the Fifth World Health Summit. The M8 Alliance has been set up as an international network of universities, academic health centers, and national academies with the goal to cooperate in the areas of medical science, medical education, and healthcare with a special focus on global health. But another equally important goal is to interact with other important partners to overcome national, institutional, and disciplinary borders and roadblocks. Therefore, this yearly event, the World Health Summit, as the central platform of the M8 Alliance, will again bring together researchers, physicians, leading government officials, and representatives from industry as well as from non-governmental organizations and different healthcare systems. This meeting is a unique occasion to remind ourselves, our societies, and our governments that health is a basic human right and public good, and that access to healthcare is probably more important for peace than wealth. The preceding four summits have proven that an open and unbiased discussion is helpful to define the common goals for improved medical science and education as well as for healthcare in a global perspective. Referring to the metaphor used this morning by Kishur Muadbari in the opening session, I would like to say he was mentioning that we all are perfect in driving our cabins in a ship, but nobody is really driving the ship as a whole. I feel ready to leave the cabin of the boat in order to help to steer, for example, the European boat and the European idea. So I'm serving on a board of Science Europe for medical science. And just yesterday, I came back from Brussels. But what was really eye-opening to me in terms of leaving the cabin and being European were the meaningless deaths of hundreds of American, African refugees at our European border during the last months and weeks and watching you, Mr. President Barroso, going to Lampedusa to pay our or your last respects in mourning to the victims and thereby symbolizing our responsibility to solve the situation was for me personally an emotional boost for being a European and being a European with identity and responsibility. In memory, of the many German refugees in the dark times of our history who were fortunately saved with open arms by so many countries in this world, 
especially Germany, should play an important role in correcting the embarrassing regulations at the European borders, which even result in a dilemma that Italian fishermen are not allowed to go out to save the lives of the refugees. As physicians, nurses, and other health professionals, we work every day in order to save lives. The deaths of hundreds of young people and even children who just were seeking a more secure and a more healthier life in our countries should once more urge us to think in a more global perspective. The recent experience of life and health threatening conditions, not only for Europe, for refugees from African countries like Ethiopia, Eritrea, and Liberia, but also for people from other regions like Syria, Burma, Bhutan, Afghanistan, in other countries and continents of the world, call for a coalition of health professionals to create an equitable system of refugee health that ensures consistently well standard of care for refugees living in camps or arriving newly in our countries. This responsibility arising from the current events can be also transferred to the more general situation of global health disparities. We think that teaming up and joint forces is a conscious and responsible international effort and are important to increase health in our societies while it's keeping the healthcare system affordable and to improve access to healthcare for people in underprivileged countries and regions in the world. Yes, we can. As medical schools and academic health centers, we have to get involved beyond political standpoints, and I'm sure we can make a difference. By close collaboration in analyzing today's knowledge and by extensively sharing international experience as well as by political debate, we will be able to define realistic goals for making healthcare accessible and affordable for those who are in greatest needs and not in power to pay. We know that these goals cannot be achieved easily and at once. We need patience and we need endurance. This will not be easy. However, if we stay focused and make small but determined steps and launch joint actions with industry and NGOs, these goals are definitely reachable. I am confident that the next two days will result in an important step forward. I wish you all interesting insights and results from the fifth World Health Summit, but also opportunities to get to know each other. And of course, to get to know the Charité and the exciting city of Berlin. Thank you very much for your kind attention. Thank you, Annette. Ladies and gentlemen, it's, not, it's an exceptional situation for an academic institution, even international, the M8 Alliance of uh, academic health centers, universities, national academies, to hold and organize a meeting in the Ministry of Foreign Affairs of a country. And we're extremely happy to have the occasion and the invitation in partnership of the Ministry of Foreign Affairs uh, to organize this meeting here in uh, Berlin in the wonderful meeting facilities, the Weltsaal of the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, and we are very thankful. Uh, may I now call upon the host of this meeting, uh, Minister of, Federal Minister of Foreign Affairs, Mr. Westerwelle. The floor is yours in your own, own house. Thank you. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, I'm delighted to receive you all here. It's a wonderful 
moment uh, that you could found your way to the Weltsaal here in the Foreign um, Ministry in Berlin. And I would like to welcome all of you, especially, of course, our uh, guests from all over the world, excellencies, ministers. It's wonderful that you could make it possible to participate in this important summit. And um, I hope, I hope that your schedule is not too busy so that you can, that you will have the opportunity to look a bit around in Berlin and enjoy the hospitality or probably even the nightlife of Berlin. You're very welcome, all of you. Uh, so it's great that you could come. And please, uh, Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, let me give a very warm and very special welcome to the President of the Commission of the European Union, to President Barroso. Put your hands together to welcome our very special guest this night. Thank you so much, Mr. President. We had a, an opportunity to exchange a bit our thoughts about other and uh, different issues, but it's always um, good to have you here, a very good friend, not only of Europe, but especially of our own country. And um, I mean, the fact that you are here, the fact that you participate at this ceremony is really an upgrade uh, of this meeting and shows all of us, and especially, of course, the observers of this um, meeting, how important the issue and the agenda today is. And please allow me, um, Mr. Gant, Mr. Wong, to uh, address a few words to um, Frau gruters kieslich um, beyond all protocol. It is not in my, in my text written here, but I listened very carefully to you. And what you said about the refugees really touched my heart. Well, this was very moving, and I couldn't agree more to what you said. Thank you so much for what you said here in this speech. I know exactly what you mean. I have been there. I saw this like the president did, and I really couldn't agree more about the way how you described the situation while we are sitting here in Europe, not somewhere here in Europe, ladies and gentlemen. Health is an essential human right and a precondition for human development individually and collectively. Without better health, we will not achieve development anywhere. Health is the basis for social, economic, and political development and for stability. Health care systems are vulnerable to destruction in times of crisis and conflicts. That is why aspects of global health can become key issues of foreign policy. Today, health is a global issue. Most of the world's big health challenges are not confined to a national level. This summer, the federal government has issued a strategy paper on global health, which outlines Germany's main goals and priorities for the years to come. My colleague and good friend, Daniel Barr, Minister Daniel Barr, will tell you more about it. Pandemics, outbreaks of contagious diseases non-communicable diseases, and global phenomena. I am glad that we are hosting this year's World Health Summit at the Federal Foreign Office. This does not only reflect the international dimension of health issues, but also the role of modern preventive diplomacy in addressing global topics such as climate change, energy security, water, and once again, last but not least, health. Germany is committed to a strong and constructive role in the field of global health. We live in a world of more than 7 billion people. There is no doubt that health must remain a priority on the agenda of the international community in the future. In former times, national governments could cooperate. Today, in times of globalization, national governments must cooperate. National governments cannot resolve all challenges and changes alone. We need the cooperation of science, economic, and civil society with politics in order to find solutions. Globalization and global networking is not only a challenge, but also a great chance. One can benefit from the experience, research, and development of others. German healthcare suppliers 
for example, are acknowledged internationally because they can provide integrated solutions. Many German companies, and some of them are represented here in this evening, many German companies are world market leaders in their fields. German technology supplies process valuable experiences in realizing health care projects both at home and abroad. So, ladies and gentlemen, if all of us strengthen the exciting, constructive international cooperation, we will be able to fight against the world's big health challenges. I feel certain, I feel certain that this World Health Summit will make a major, contri a major contribution to this goal. I thank I thank you all for your participation this night and the next two days. I thank you for your attendance and wish you a stimulating discussion at this fifth World Health Summit. And once again, to our foreign guests, very welcome in Germany, very welcome in Berlin. Enjoy your stay. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Minister Vestavelle. Ladies and gentlemen, one of the hallmarks of the World Health Summit uh, is the meeting of uh, people from academia, industry, civic society, the media, with policymakers. And probably the policymaker that has the greatest responsibility for trying to effect everything that we've been discussing is usually the Minister of Health. And we are delighted this evening to have the Federal Minister of Health for Germany, Mr. Dianova, to address us. Minister, please. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, there is one word, word that from now on our languages will never be able to do without. That word is globalization. Technical progress has indeed brought us all closer together. The effects of this global world can be witnessed day in, day out, in the most diverse areas, each with their own impact. It is not only financial transactions or business deals that are conducted across national borders. We also communicate with ease over large distances with our mobile telephones. And thanks to the internet, we share large amounts of information in seconds. More than two billion flights per year is a clear sign that in the meantime we are able to cover even the greatest distances. Technical progress has brought us together and made us into a global community. But like every other community, the members of a community of nations must also assume responsibility for one another it follows that globalization can no longer be seen as a development that technical progress has made possible for us. It must also be understood as a political challenge we must face. Indeed, only when we manage to use the possibilities that globalization offers us in such a way that all states and consequently all the people of this world can benefit from it, can we really see it as an attainment. Getting to this point also implies calling for basic social rights for all. As WHO's constitution reminds us, access to health care is one of the fundamental rights of every human being without distinction of race, religion, political belief, economic or social condition. We know that some two billion of the total of seven billion persons inhabiting our earth today have no access to proper health care. One of the challenges facing us is to guarantee sufficient health care for these people. I am firmly convinced that this can be achieved by joint, coordinated action on the part of the community of nations. Today, Germany is already a reliable partner in the efforts to meet the current challenges pre presented by global health policy. Since 2000, for example, our expenditure on bilateral and multilateral development cooperation in the health sector has more than tripled. We are the third largest regular contrib contributor, especially to and for WHO. Germany is an active member of the UNAIDS program coordinating board 
and one of the five funding states of the International Agency for Research on Cancer in Lyon. This is a commitment that we wish and intend to further expand in terms of its diversity. For Germany, one thing is clear. We want to, and we will, continue to assume responsibility in the future when it comes to guaranteeing healthcare for all of the people on this earth. On the 10th of July this year, the federal cabinet adopted the Shaping Global Health, Taking Joint Action, Embracing Responsibility Strategy Paper. It was the first time that the entire federal government joined together to adopt a framework document on global health. Three guiding, three guiding principles underpin Germany's commitment to a global health policy. First of all, it is our goal to improve and to protect the health of Germany's population in the long term. However, in a globalized world, national action alone is not enough. It is true that many health problems manifest locally. However, they originate in complex global scenarios. As a result, we can only provide comprehensive health protection locally if we take joint action globally. Secondly, we seek to German experience, expertise, and funds available to improve global health. We want to show that we are serious about meeting our international commitments. We want to help our partners establish healthcare systems that are sustainably financed and socially just. This will be part of our contribution to reducing poverty worldwide, to increasing economic productivity and enhancing social cohesion. Thirdly, we are committed to effective, cooperative, equitable action in the international fora that are dedicated to global health policy. Only strong international institutions that enjoy equal rights can, can act effectively in coordinating with each other. In adopting this strategy paper, we emphasize once again our will to take an active part in shaping global health policy. We want to act in concert with our partners. And we stand ready to assume responsibility for ensuring proper health care for people all over the world. We are also committed to a strong European presence in global health. Germany sees its contribution as a part of the overall European commitment. Germany acts with and through Europe. The EU, the European Union, has a decisive role to play in meeting the global challenges in the field of health. This is reflected in our strategy paper, and I fully support this view. However, with this strategy paper, Germany also plays tribute to the strong and indispensable engagement of civil society and advocates that their participation in international processes be strengthened. This is why, from the very beginning, we included civil society in the paper's elaboration. We embraced their ideas, and these suggestions went on to influence the paper's design. This makes our strategy paper different from those of other countries. Distinguished ladies and gentlemen, I have explained to you the principles that shaped our strategy paper for global health. Now I would, remiss, now I would be remiss if I did not share with you the priority areas we believe would improve, improve health worldwide. It was important for us to find priority areas in which Germany is comparatively strong, because we can help best in the areas in which we are ourselves, ourselves are strong. These are, first, providing effective protection against cross-border hazards to health. Second, strengthening health systems worldwide, facilitating development. Third, expanding intersectoral cooperation into actions with other areas of policy. Fourth, health services, health services research and the healthcare industry providing important input for global health. And fifth, strengthening the global health architecture. I would also like to emphasize here at the strategy papers describes, strategy, strategy papers describes the general contours of Germany's global health policy. By no means does this setting of priorities signify a reduction of our commitment to these areas alone. Sufficient room remains for individual approaches to ac accommodate special situations and to cope with new challenges. This strategy paper also enables us to optimize the coordination process among the different federal ministries. We are creating the preconditions 
for the efficient strategy planning, strategic planning for Ger of Germany's contribution. It enables the federal government to show a united face on global health policy. Furthermore, I would like to point out that conclusive answers to all of the urgent questions of global health policy cannot be expected from a strategy paper. The aim of the federal government is to make a fundamental commitment to global health policy clear using the framework offered by this strategy paper. It describes why Germany should assume a leading role and which partners the government will be, reaching out to in, will be reaching out to in its drive to meet the challenges at hand. In it, we illustrate the principles guiding our action, reveal the values that underpin our approach and at the same time set priorities for our engagement. With this framework document, we commit ourselves to take an active role in global health. That is why the adoption of the strategy paper is not a static end of a discourse. Instead, I see it as the beginning of a more intensive discussion of Germany's role in global health policy. I am convinced that such a discussion would be positive for all of us and lead to new insights and acti activities. Thank you for your attention. I've seen the uh, energetic, young, healthy shortcut of Minister Barron through the podium, so I thought I'd try myself whether I'm still able to, to manage. Thank you very much, Minister Barr. <clears throat> uh, we are impressed not only by your uh, quick and energetic jump to the podium, but especially by what you said. Um, we are impressed, we are happy, and as a citizen of this country, I must say I'm also proud that uh, among the various ministries involved under the aspect of health and all policies, a paper has been produced which is far-reaching beyond the present government to the future and a great encouragement for us and for many in the world who are looking for which way Germany is really going. Uh, if Germany uh, does something in major strategic areas, they usually look for partners. And uh, frequently it's France. And of course, when we started the, uh, uh, to make it easy first, uh, we, when we started to organize the World Health Summit, uh, uh, Chancellor Merkel and the President of the French Republic, by tradition, are the patrons of uh, the World Health Summit since the last five years. But this year, we have a very special patron, and that is President Barroso of the European Commission. And uh, in addition to having this French-German partnership on patronage and in it having the, uh, the uh, president of the European Commission, we also had a new institute on public health and global health organized first on the uh, occasion of the 50-year anniversary of the Elysee Treaty, which is a Virchow Villamé Center for Public Health Paris Berlin. And this, of course, also is mentioned as a nucleus for the European Initiative on Public Health to increase our efforts to improve public health in Europe, but of course with the responsibility worldwide. I would have loved to introduce President Barroso, but there's somebody who could not do that much better than I do, and that is uh, Professor Günther Stock, who is uh, already mentioned president of the Berlin Brandenburg Academy, but at the same time president of ALEA, the Academies of Europe, and Günther, you are uh, please introducing the guest of honor. Thank you. <clears throat> President Barroso, Your Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, dear colleagues. It's a great honor and a great pleasure for me to introduce Professor Jose Manuel Barroso, President of the European Commission. He has kindly agreed to give a keynote speech at our World Health Summit. This is probably not a place to talk in extenso about Professor Barroso's biography. It should suffice that President Barroso is a professor of European studies. As Minister of Foreign Affairs in Portugal, he was probably the driving force of the self-determination process in East Timor. We all recall these complicated days. Eminent prestige led him 
to become Prime Minister of Portugal in 2002, and since 2004 is now President of the European Commission. He has given this office impact due to his wise leadership, and the World Economic Forum already declared him in 93 a global leader for tomorrow, and the European Voice named him European of the Year 2006. A leader within Europe from time to time has to speak clearly about the state of the Union, as Manuel Barroso did in his address 2012. And I would like to quote, at a time when the European Union continues to be in a crisis, a financial, economic crisis, a social crisis, but also a political crisis, a crisis of confidence. With these words, President Barroso clearly marked the challenges for Europe ahead. And he made it perfectly clear that there are solutions to this crisis. He pleaded for a fundamental change in mental attitude. And he considered this change in mental attitude as a major challenge for all of us, and not only for politicians. I would like to add that we in academia have always been at the forefront of European values. And we should take up again with more engagement our responsibility, recognizing the commonality of our European interest and values. Because after all, Europe is more than anything else, an intellectual space with all its diversity. We would call it in German, geistige Einheit. Hence, it is more than consequent that President Barroso inspired and created this year a new initiative called the New Narrative for Europe. An initiative which exactly targets what we need because we need to think and we have to speak differently about Europe as we currently tend to do. Europe as an intellectual Europe, not only an economic Europe, is at stake. As academicians, United in ALEA, all European academies, we fully support this approach. President Barroso's interest for science is powered by his knowledge that the challenges ahead of us can only be mastered with science. He has clearly recognized that especially health, global health, is one of those major challenges. Therefore, we gratefully acknowledge his engagement also in this field and we are privileged to have him here at our World Health Summit giving a key note underlying the importance of global health on his and our agenda. President Barroso, thank you very much for being here and sharing your time with us. Thank you. Dear Minister of Foreign Affairs, Guido Vesterveld, dear friend, dear Minister of Health, Daniel Barr, dear Professor Detlef Ganten and Professor John Young, co-chairs of this World Health Summit, dear Mrs. Grutas Kirschlich, Dean of the Charité Medical University of Berlin, dear President of the Berlin Brandenburg Academy of Science and all European Academies, Gunther Stock, dear Ministers, my dear friend, Ramos Horta, Nobel Peace Prize, great fighter for the freedom of Timor-Leste, East Timor. Ladies and gentlemen, dear friends, first of all, let me tell you it's indeed a pleasure for me to be here in Berlin, here in the Foreign Affairs Ministry. Thank you, Guido, for your very kind words. Um, in this World Health Summit, because in fact, Germany is a country that has been doing great things for health, in Europe and through Europe also in the world. I want to pay tribute to all those in Germany from the medical professions to the poly political leaders, the policy makers, the academics, the scientists, the business companies that have been promoting health in Europe and worldwide. Health policy in the broadest sense also touches the core of what European Union does. It is at the heart of our social model for which Europe is working hard in order to safeguard it, and where governments have a role and responsibility to help and protect its citizens' well-being. 
It is fundamental to our economic policy approach, based on effective public services, supporting innovative researchers and inventive entrepreneurs. It is an essential part of the role we play worldwide, allowing others to learn from what we have learned and profit from the successes we have achieved, and vice versa. And this is an iner inherent element of the European philosophy, a firm and undiluted belief in the potential of science and the benefits of cooperation. All these aspects are included in the approach taken by this conference and in a program packed with authoritative speakers and I'm sure very interesting debates. Clearly, this alliance of health centers, universities, and national academies bringing together political leaders, policymakers, executives, and scientists has the ideas to strengthen the health agenda of the future and experience to influence and improve the way we tackle jointly our challenges. So I'm more than happy to act as patron of this prestigious fifth World Health Summit and to highlight the role Europe has to play in global health. It is important to note that the World Health Summit and the M8 Alliance start from the same basic principles as the European Commission in its approach. Connecting the public sector with the private, linking the science to the policy, and the laboratory to the boardroom, sharing knowledge and giving opportunities to the knowledgeable. It has proved its added value in the past, and I have no doubt that this year's summit will prove to be equally successful. Ladies and gentlemen, at first glance, the emphasis on health at European level may be somewhat surprising, at least for those who follow the European debate. After all, it is still mainly member states' responsibility to define their health policies and to organize and manage health services and medical care. That's what in Europe we call the principle of subsidiarity. So it's mainly, I insist, a national responsibility. But the European Union complements national policies to prevent diseases, addresses cross-border health threats, and ensures a high level of public health overall. There is a lot we can do to support innovation and research in health, in education, and leadership for sustainable health systems, and in developing synergies with other sectors. This is more than a specific policy area, but a point of attention across a wide range of European policies from social affairs to education, from research to taxation, from consumer rights to public service reform. That's why in the European Commission we try to deal with health issues on what some call horizontal or transversal uh, way, because in fact it is, I re re repeat more than just one policy area. That's why we try to make what we call the mainstream of health objectives also through other policies, for instance, climate policy, environmental policy, or consumer policy. I will give you a few examples. There is European legislation on health products and cross-border care, for instance, on clinical trials and medical devices, on fees for pharmaceuticals and a directive on patients' rights in cross-border health care. We deal with determining causes of health problems such as tobacco products, which are still the biggest cause of avoidable illness in Europe. We are, with different programs and actions, helping member states to improve health in the European Union for European Union citizens. We directly, through our third health program for the next European financial period from 2014 to 2020, we are directly financing projects strengthening the links between economic growth and a healthy population. And we assist on a daily basis in tackling cross-border health threats, in particular in the case of communicable diseases like avian flu and pandemic influenza that very easily spread from country to country. In the field of animal health, and notably on diseases transmissible to humans, I'm proud to say that we have achieved considerable results. Diseases like avian flu have not finally had major impact on human health in the European Union. And human cases of salmonellosis in Europe, for instance, have decreased from 
around 200,000 in 2004 to less than 100,000 in 2011. And this trend is still continuing, thanks to the intensive control of programs applied on poultry and also the pig sectors in all member states with European Commission's financial support. A considerable number of human lives were saved and hospitalization costs were reduced while at the same time this made our meat products more competitive on international markets as European Union products are more and more perceived as the safest in the world. To sum up, the organization and the funding of healthcare systems in our member states is and will remain a national responsibility. The European Union, however, can positively improve the context in which Europe's member states operate their health systems and support them in their actions. And the impact of this is profound in terms of the rights of patients, the role of researchers, and the very structures of healthcare. Certainly, one of the most important contributions is our effort towards the effectiveness and financial health of health systems themselves. The healthcare sector accounts for 11% of the total European workforce, or around 25 million jobs, and for 10% of the European Union GDP. That in itself, plus the large and increasing share of healthcare costs in the European Union, makes the case for improving cost effectiveness and the financial sustainability of health systems all the more relevant. Making our healthcare sector more resilient is one of the great challenges of today, especially in light of competitive pressures which our economies face globally. And we need to find responses to the structural changes in demography and increasing burden of chronic diseases in Europe, while the pace of technology is increasing and the limits of public finances are more stringent than before. One figure says it all. Treating just brain disorders annually costs Europe around 798 billion euros. And in this particular sector, we are financing the Human Brain Project at 1 billion euros over the next 10 years. Progress in this field is already significant. Just think about deep brain stimulation that alleviates the symptoms of Parkinson's disease. As I said in the beginning, health systems are the cornerstones of Europe's welfare. We must cherish their success and guarantee their future. For this to happen, we must accept that the time has come for structural reforms in health systems. That is the case around the world, and especially so in Europe, where they are highly developed and effective, but for that reason, also elaborate and sometimes expensive. If we don't reform, we will compromise the universality and quality of care which form the cornerstone of Europe's welfare state. If a health system is not performing well, it will not be able to provide the highest quality health care to all in the future, and we must not allow that to happen. The European Union, and notably the European Commission, is an important factor for translating this analysis into concrete action. As part of our economic governance in the European Union health care related issues, form part of the country-specific recommendations which the Commission has been addressing to 11 of our member states. That is one of innovation of the new system of governance we have today in Europe, what we shall be called European Semester, where the European Commission is asked to give concrete country-specific recommendations to all the members of the European Union. And the focus has been on the need to increase cost effectiveness and financial sustainability of the health systems in these countries. Apart from the countries and the program, we have given that country-specific recommendations to countries such as Austria, Bulgaria, Czech Republic, Germany, Spain, Finland, France, Malta, Poland, Romania, and Slovakia. A reflection process on modern and sustainable health systems has been launched within the European Council, so among heads of state and government of the European Union. We know, of course, that there is no one-size-fits-all solution for all countries alike. There are different traditions, different models, even if there are some points in common, namely the idea, so important idea, that health is a fundamental right and that the state has an obligation to provide this kind of protection to that right. This is the European model at its best. But even if the models are very different afterwards in concrete terms, 
I believe that all national health systems can benefit from an efficiency check, from greater use of health technology, and from a greater focus on smart investments. The question is not so much whether we spend more or less, but how to spend better. We need a smarter Europe, and for this we need also a smarter approach to health. We must also look to the benefits that greater patient choice and empowerment can play in driving change in health systems. The European Union's directive on cross-border health care enables EU patients to seek care in any other member state. I mean, this is, I can say, a real revolution. Can you imagine that in other parts of the world? It's simply not thinkable. In Europe, we have now this right. One person receives health care in another member state as if it could do it in its, his or her own country. And this directive also sets out their rights, particularly to information on quality and safety. Choice will help improve the efficiency of the systems. Empowerment will help to improve the quality of care offered. This must go hand in hand. That's why, as was already stated, the role of civil society is also extremely important. Beyond scientists, policymakers, political leaders, academia, civil society has also a role to play in the way we address collectively these health values and these health challenges. Health, I repeat, is a value in itself, but it is also a crucial component towards economic success. The importance of this sector and Europe's long tradition and wide experience in this field provides plenty of opportunities for future growth. I personally am convinced that this is one of the sectors that will grow more in the near future and that will bring more value for growth in Europe. Good health, of course, is first of all good for people. Good health can also be very good for business, whereas poor health is notably bad for business. Today, absenteeism represents 3 to 6% of working time lost, leading to a yearly cost of about 2.5% of GDP in Europe. In order to reap both the health benefits and the economic potential of the health sector, we need to foster innovation and keep Europe at the forefront of scientific progress. Currently, the health sector already employs 15% of university graduates in the European Union. And the demand is growing. It's precisely one of the sectors where we have a mismatch between the jobs people seek and the jobs are on offer. Health sector, not only medical doctors, but also nurses and many other professions related to health can indeed be developed in the future. The European Commission is keen to encourage the potential of this sector also for jobs. For example, we have brought together at European level around 1,000 public and private sect stakeholders in an innovation partnership on active and healthy aging. This partnership aims to translate innovation into concrete solutions that assist elderly people in living healthy and independent lives, support the provision of high-quality care, and help our industry to remain competitive. We also support cooperation between large-scale industry, small and medium-sized enterprises, and research organizations in the field of new treatments and diagnostic tools. We have a public-private partnership, the Joint Undertaking on Innovative Medicines Initiative, IMI as it is better known, to which we have dedicated important resources, no less than 1.7 billion euro. Overall, the Commission is the world's third largest funder of research on poverty-related and neglected infectious diseases, thereby contributing significantly to the long-term improvement of global health. Since 2007, we have invested an annual average of almost 170 million euros in global health research. We are intent on keeping that leading role in the promotion and financing of research and innovation. The next EU program for research and innovation, called Horizon 2020, is the way to do this. Several societal challenges will be addressed, considered priorities under the new program, including health, demographic change, demographic change and well-being, for which a budget of 7 billion euro has been earmarked. Such research will improve our understanding of the causes and mechanisms underlying health, healthy aging and disease, 
improve our ability to monitor health and to prevent, detect, and treat diseases, and test and demonstrate new models and tools for healthcare delivery. We are optimistic that European Union funded research in the area of health will continue to deliver innovative solutions in the area of biodiagnostics, biotechnologies, and surgical and regenerative medicine, building on the success of the living heart valve replacements, the use of spider silk to repair joint damage, and development of simple breast tests to diagnose cancer. These are concrete examples of projects funded by the European Union. For innovation to succeed, we not only need to funding, the funding, but also need the right regulatory framework. In the past few years, the European Union has revised European legislation on pharmaceuticals, for example, and the Commission has introduced incentives for development of orphan medicines for the benefit of patients with rare diseases. A revision of the European Union legislation on clinical trials is also in the pipeline. It is aimed at supporting the conduct of clinical trials in Europe while ensuring the safety of patients participating in a trial. In the field of research and innovation, good progress has been made to achieve a single market, but there is still a lot of work to do. Investment in R&D is vital, but we need fully functional research and innovation systems to use that money best. We now need all member states and all those involved in research and research funding to make a major push towards a true European research area. We also need to grasp the opportunities offered by digital technology. E-health solutions, such as teleconsultations and telemonitoring, are very promising. They can, can improve access to healthcare, increase the quality and efficiency of care, and empower patients. This is why the Commission has a European He Health Action Plan to increase the uptake of He Health and an He Health Network so that member states can align their efforts and create common policies. Ladies and gentlemen, if we put so much emphasis on health issues and so much faith in research and innovation within Europe, it is only natural that this form a large and increasing part of our efforts worldwide as well. Health is one of the main strands of the European Union's development agenda, and we have a huge role to play. Contributing around 50 billion euro a year, the European Union is by far the biggest donor in the world, representing 56% of global public aid. Despite the crisis, Europe's track record has remained unchanged and only recently member states have reconfirmed their commitment to dedicate 0.7% of their GNP on development aid by 2015. I think we should be proud of that effort and confident of the fact that with this investment we can make a difference. In the context of the Millennium Development Goals campaign, for instance, over the last 10 years we have helped 70 million more households to have access to drinking water, and 7.5 million births were attended by skilled health personnel thanks to direct aid from the European Union. We must keep pursuing all MDGs' rights to the end, and for that reason we have made available an extra billion euros to helping these countries and MDGs who are most off track. In fact, I've announced this last year in the margins of the General Assembly of the United Nations in New York. Some of the more problematic issues are indeed health issues, notably child mortality, sanitation, and women's health. The current MDG initiative funds 11 countries in the health sector for accelerated progress towards the achievement of MDG4 on child health and five, objective five, on maternal health for a total amount of 280 million euros. We must build on that for the development goals beyond 2015. Our aim on the post-2015 global development agenda is to provide a balanced approach to poverty eradication and sustainable development, ensuring basic living standards, including health for all. The European Union is also committed to allocate at least 20% of its aid budget for 2014 to 2020, the next seven-year period, to human development, including health. Even today, of the aid budget managed directly by the European Commission, which reaches some 10 billion euros annually, 
about 500 million is devoted specifically to health issues. The lion's share of the EU health aid is deployed through country programs directly agreed with the concerned developing countries, providing comprehensive support to national health systems in 30 of the poorest countries. In some of my visits to some of these countries, I could see on the ground directly the important uh, contribution that this funding can give to save so many lives. I think it's an important point to make because sometimes we listen that our people have doubts about aid for development. Look, if they go to Africa, if they see the difference, the lives that could be saved because there was international funding, I think they will not keep that idea. Of course, we can always look to more effective aids uh, schemes and to improve also the efficiency of development aid. But let's be frank, we have to continue to make a big effort to the developing countries because we see that that can make, make a real difference for so many people. I remember hospitals I've seen from Tanzania to Mozambique, from uh, Cape Verde to um, Senegal, to uh, West, East, Southern Africa, where the concrete contribution of the European Union in health and in other sectors, also in refugees, Jordan, but Syrian refugees, without the European Union support, people will not be alive or they will not have the access to minimum of health care and also the right to education. So I think we need to make a case for the need to continue some effort in development aid. And these efforts in the field of health are complemented by our global support, in particular to the World Health Organization, the leading authority setting the agenda within the United Nations systems, and with issue-specific global health initiatives like the Global Fund to Fight AIDS, Tuberculosis, and Malaria. Since it was founded at the initiative of G8 in 2001, the European Union has contributed more than 1.1 billion euro to the Global Fund, over half of the total amount. We also strongly support the Gavi Alliance for Vaccines and Immunizations and the Global Polio Eradication Initiative, campaigns that over recent years have shown just how much we can achieve if we are willing to invest in the right causes and support the people of the world. Because experience has taught us that bringing the right people together is just as important as the funding as such. We live in a world of increasingly fruitful partnerships between governments and the private sector, between universities and international organizations. They are proving to be the most effective way of combining the knowledge and creativity that often comes from the bottom up with the necessary coordination and prioritization to be done at top decision-making levels. Horizon 2020, our research program, draws on that successful formula, aiming not only at supporting collaboration between researchers in Europe, but fully open to international networks, building on partnerships with other funders, both public and private, since the scale, scope, and ambition of the research and investments for global health cannot be achieved and delivered in isolation. The European Commission's flagship research initiatives in this area will be the expansion of the European and Developing Countries Clinical Trial Partnership with Sub-Saharan Africa, which already has projects involving 70 institutions in Europe and 185 in Africa, with half of the clinical trials led by African researchers, and the Innovative Medicines Initiative with the pharmaceutical industry, the largest public-private partnership in pharmaceutical research in the world. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm sorry if I was a little bit long, but I just wanted to give you a picture of what we are doing respecting the subsidiarity principle in terms of action in the health sector. I think many of our citizens are not aware of the big effort that European taxpayers are doing for health in Europe and in the world. And I think we should basically be um, proud of it, not being complacent of course, but being proud of it, knowing that we have still a lot to do, but thanks to our political decisions, thanks to our academia, to our business, to our universities, to our scientists, to our professional uh, in medicines, we are indeed achieving a lot. But I hope that all the information I've given to you just now does not distract us from the more important points. And the more important points, I think, are three. First of all, health is a fundamental right for every human being. Second, health has a value in itself, apart from the economic and other important consideration. And third, 
health is a global issue that requires strong international cooperation. I think these are the most important messages. And I'm sure that your initiative, the World Health Summit, uh, successfully linking academics, policymakers, civil society and business in a common cause is a very important contribution. I want to honor your commitment and I want to tell that the European Commission will continue to support your efforts, add to your understanding and also learn from your experience. For all these reasons, I wish you a very fruitful summit. I thank you for your kind attention. Thank you very much, uh, President Barroso, for that truly inspiring message. Um, and uh, I think that the, the European Commission's commitment to global health is something that will reverberate all around the world. Thank you very much. It's with uh, great pleasure that I would like to uh, introduce the, the next speaker, who actually needs very little introduction. Uh, professor Aaron Chekhanova is Distinguished Research Professor at the Technion Israel Institute of Technology in Israel. Uh, a medical doctor by training, he is a graduate of the Hebrew University in Jerusalem and has probably devoted his entire life to studying a critical process in the human cell and that is the whole process of ubiquination where cells undergo degradation. It was his work in ubiquination that has led to many honors. Professor Kekhanover is a member of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, the National Academy of Sciences of the United States, and the Institute of Medicine. He was honored with the Albert Lasker Award in 2000 and the Nobel Prize in Chemistry in 2004. And we're delighted to have him here this evening to address us. Professor Kekhanover, please. Thank you. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I'm coming, as you heard, from the bedside, from the patient side, and from the laboratory bench, where things are truly happening, and science, all in all, is doing well. The road is bumpy, there are many obstacles, but the obstacles in science are mostly technological. Obviously, we couldn't have developed modern drugs without understanding the structure of DNA, and then without having sequencing technologies, and then without having modern imaging technologies. So science is moving. From time to time, it's moving too slow, uh, and the public and policymakers are not satisfied with the pace that we are moving. But nevertheless, um, progress in science is huge. If we compare medicine 50 years ago to medicine of today, we are talking completely different uh, worlds. The problem that we are here today is not to hear about the progress in science, though I'm going to give you a little bit briefing about it. 
The problem is to take the achievements in science and bringing them to the patient worldwide. This distance seems to be extremely difficult to overcome. And for me, you know, if you just look at the world, not at Europe, you look at the world and you look at a simple piece of data and that life span of different people, you will see the huge difference. In OECD and developed countries, people are living more than 80 years. Women a little bit more, men a little bit less, but we are talking even over 80. Look at your great neighbor, Russia. People in Russia are living 65 years on the average. 65 years. People at my age in Russia are dead by now, on the average. Go to Africa, and you will drop 15 years more. People are dying at the age of 50. 50 years of age was the age that people died in Europe at the end of the 19th century. So Africa is 100 and more years behind Europe nowadays. And this is this modern world. The problem is taking the achievements of science and bringing them to the rest of the world. For me, it's immoral and unacceptable. And I'm drawing on Aneta's uh, um, metaphor that people in this world are suffering and dying while the drug that can rescue their lives is in a distance of a kilometer or 10 kilometer or 1,000 kilometers. And by one or 10 or 100 or 1,000 kilometers, I don't mean just the physical distance. I mean all the obstacles that make this drug or device, let it be MRI, let it be a professional manpower, a nurse, a physician. For me, it's unacceptable that this drug or device or manpower cannot make its way to the patient while it's available and the knowledge is there and science has already achieved it. It's like seeing these people, the refugees from North Africa, drowning in the Mediterranean and we are just looking there. It's the same very problem. The same very problem. And by this distance, I mean all the factors that prevent this drug or means to get there. It's education of the people themselves. It's policy making. It's corruption. It's governance. It's finances. It's a whole set of components that otherwise, if would put in place, should bring these devices to these people. And, and, and millions of lives could have been saved if we would just overcome these obstacles. So I'm not into policy making and I'm not into um, the pharma industry, though based on our discovery, drugs were developed and are distributed and are being used worldwide. But nevertheless, as a physician, as a world citizen, this is for me unacceptable and this is the purpose that we are here, to find ways to do it. But nevertheless, let me take you I prepared a small presentation, but I may, um, um, over, may, may not use it. Let me take you, nevertheless, to the world of new medicine in few words. And the world of new medicine is going to be vastly different than the world that we are living today. If we think of drug development, and Chris is here maybe to tell you a little bit more, and we just think about it in an in, in, in historical perspective, there are several eras. The first era was the era of incidental discoveries. People didn't even mean to discover what they discovered. Think about aspirin that was developed actually here in Germany by Bayer. Felix Hoffmann, a chemist in Bayer um, company, um, he knew about aspirin, he knew about the pain alleviating characteristic of aspirin, but aspirin was not in use. We are talking about the 20s of this century. His father contracted rheumatoid arthritis and he decided to treat his father. He went to the basement synthesized aspirin, and lo and behold, aspirin not only took the pain from his father, but also took the whole inflammation away. It turned out to be a very strong anti-inflammatory drug. Now we understand why. He went to the management of Bayer and convinced them to make aspirin. And in my opinion, I don't have the data. Chris may be able to correct me. Aspirin has become the number one blockbuster in the pharma industry by utilization by tons, by weight, not by money making. Doesn't make any money. I buy my own yearly aspirin for $2 in CVS or Walgreens in the United States. So aspirin was a coincidence. Penicillin was a coincidence the same, the same way. 
Sir Alexander Fleming discovered aspirin by a complete coincidence. I'm not going to, to describe you the details of the experiment, but it was a Petri dish that would have otherwise thrown away because it was contaminated with the mold. And he looked and saw that the mold secretes some material that doesn't let bacteria grow. He didn't understand himself the greatness of his discovery. And later on, Florian and, and Ernst Chain um, made aspirin the first antibiotic, and the world changed completely. Then we move to another era, the era of screening, that we are still into it. Again, I'm jumping. And chemistry made millions of compounds. People built libraries, and then people said, OK, we have millions of compounds. Let's just screen them. One of them will open the door. If the, this door is closed, if I shall try 1,000 or 2,000 keys, one of them is doomed to open it, because the keys companies are making so many, so many keyholes. And probably evolution also did, many more than several thousand, probably millions, shapes in nature that can be opened by the different compounds that one will make it. I'll bring you just one example for this era, another very successful drug that is sold now by billions of dollars. And those are statins, statins that lower cholesterol and prevent heart diseases, were developed by, uh, were originally discovered by Akira Endo, a Japanese pharmacist that screened the library of natural compound to look for cholesterol synthesis inhibition. And at the early 70s, late, late 60s, early 70s, he discovered statins that brought to the pharma industry billions of dollars and one of the most successful drugs ever produced. But then we became more sophisticated, and now we are entering a new era, and that's the era of personalized medicine. Every drug that you will use, you will see that has, it has a whole range of effects. For some patients, it's extremely helpful. For some patients, it's only partially helpful. Some patients are not helped by, at all by the drug, and some patients are even harmed. They develop side effects. And we didn't understand what's going on here. And it's only now, by having access to our own DNA, we shall be able to understand the individual differences between each and every one of us. And accordingly, to develop newer drug and to fit them into our own genetic repertoire. I'm describing the roadmap very superficially, because it's not only in our genes. It's also in our proteins, because at the end, the proteins are the machines on which we are moving. But we are moving, we are flipping the mirror from the disease to the disease within the context of the patient. Until now, a woman came with a lump with a tumor in the breast. It was a breast cancer. And now we start to understand that woman A has a very different breast cancer than woman B. And woman B has a very different breast cancer than woman C. And woman A should be treated with Herceptin, which is a specific antibody to treat a mutation in the EGF receptor. And woman B should be treated with tamoxifen, which is an anti-mutated estrogen receptor. But woman B cannot be treated with what woman A is being treated. And the same for woman C and woman D and woman E. And we are, trying, we are starting now by looking into the DNA to stratify the diseases. We shall have many more diseases, unfortunately. So under the same umbrella of breast cancer or prostate cancer, or even Alzheimer, or even excess of cholesterol, hypercholesterolemia, we are going to see many more clinical entities, and each will have to be treated differently. So that's the gain that we are having now from looking into our DNA. We are gaining a very sharp and a very accurate pair of spectacles that will enable us to look at each disease within the context of the individual, the named individual. From now on, the first examination that a woman or a man with a cancer or with any disease is going to undergo in the emergency room is not going to be looking at the disease. It's going to sequence the DNA and first getting a profile. And then they will be also looking at the protein profile, at the proteome and the metabolome and so on and so forth. Obviously, lack of time, and we are here in a, you know, describing just the frames, prevent me from going into any details. But again, we are going to look at the disease from the point of view of the patient himself. Now, what is the price that we are going to pay for this lunch? And with that, I'm going to end. 
There are numerous prices. The technological uh, bumps of, on this road are enormous. Many diseases are caused by numerous genes. It won't be one single gene, and each gene has a different effect. Psychiatric diseases, which are a major burden on economy and on human beings, are awfully complex as far as their genetic and environmental um, um, factors uh, and causes are, um, um, uh, are concerned. Not all diseases are caused by genetic factors. Some of them are environmental, some of them are mixed, and so on and so forth. The pharma companies are going to face uh, major problems because each disease that was now, or many diseases that were now characterized by blockbusters are going to be stratified, which challenge the pharma company. But I want to point out at my closing comment on one important factor. And this factor is the bioethical implications of subjecting our DNA to testing. By subjecting our DNA to testing, we are entering a very um, sensitive minefield. We are giving to the doctor and to the authorities probably the most sensitive information we all have. It's not only personalized. This information is also predictive because it may tell the doctor also what diseases I'm sensitive to. You know, you can imagine that I'm walking into the emergency room with a chest pain and my DNA is being taken and I'm walking out with a diagnosis, may walk out with a diagnosis that may be in several years I'm going to suffer from either schizophrenia or Alzheimer's disease or any other disease that I didn't come to the emergency room with the question of, and what are the implications of this knowledge? Let me just bring you one example to what I mean. You may decide, well, I, don't, I want to be immune from this information. I don't want this information. I don't want the doctor to tell me what I'm going to have. Let me bring you one fresh example that you all heard about. The example, I wanted to screen the slide of a beautiful lady called Angelina Julie. You heard about this beautiful lady. Angelina Julie came forward. And she admitted that she has a mutation in a gene which is called BRCA1. BRCA1 is a gene that carries high susceptibility, huge susceptibility, to both breast cancer and ovarian cancer. And she said to the woman in the world, I realized that my mother had breast cancer. My aunt, at the time that she came out, her aunt died meanwhile, had ovarian cancer. I underwent the test and I decided that being also a carrier of the same mutation that my mother and my aunt have, I'm going to remove my two breasts and later on to remove my ovaries. Well, this was awfully courageous. The whole world just wowed. It was covered the front page of the New York Times. Did she solve the problem? Yes, for herself, but not for her daughters. Because her daughters and the daughters of numerous Angelina Julies that may even sit in this audience, and the problem for them is not solved. What a daughter of a woman that carries BRCA1 and is 16 years old or 20 years old or 24 years old is going to do? She's may, she may carry a ticking bomb. Is she going to the doctor to identify the ticking bomb or she is going to ignore it? What she is going to tell to her boyfriend or to her husband or to the kids? So you see that this new revolution is going to penetrate underneath our door even without us willing it. You know, we cannot ignore it. In this case, nobody can ignore it. And I can bring you numerous other examination, numerous other examples where we shall not be able to ignore this information. Again, it's going to be a major revolution that is going to affect each and every one of us, even our love life, even the way that we recognize partners in life, what do we want to know about them and what we don't want to know about them, the choice of kids, it's going to change the definition of disease. What is a disease? For now, a disease that I cannot get up in the morning and go to work. But the new mother of the future that is going to diagnose the newborn, the not yet newborn, is going to decide for herself what she wants and what she doesn't want. And the definition of a disease of the textbook of medicine is going to change dramatically. This is not frightening because side by side medicine is also going to change. We are going to have genetic therapy. We are going to be able to introduce genes to replace sick genes with healthy genes. All in all, 
we are going to enter a major revolution that, in my opinion, medicine has not seen in the past. So far, we have climbed medicine step by step. You know, imaging, X-ray. X-ray has been with us for 112 years, since 1901, since Conrad Wilhelm Röntgen invented the X-ray, and then drugs and antibiotics and so on. The DNA revolution is going to be the steepest and the most meaningful we have ever undergone. And I think that this also will require collaboration between different disciplines. It's not only between physicians and scientists and chemists that will synthesize the drugs, but also between scientists and clergymen and policymakers and legislators and philosophers and sociologists and psychologists. So this is the new challenge. Obviously, this challenge is mostly the challenge that the Western world is going to see initially, but at the very end, I'm going back to the very beginning of my talk, we shall need to take all these achievements and to make them available to every human being that walks on the face of Earth, because this is, as President Barroso said, a very basic and fundamental human right. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Aaron, for sharing with us your experience as a top scientist in the life science area, but also your wisdom of a long life in, uh, in the world. And uh, as you mentioned in the end, uh, all the science doesn't help. If there are no products on the market, if there are no applied uh, achievements which can be brought to the people. And it's very fitting, I feel, last but not least, to have a person who is really responsible for bringing the inventions of science to the market. Uh, Chris Fiebacher is uh, related to many countries, to Germany, to Canada, to France. So he's a world citizen. He is uh, president of the Federation of European Pharmaceutical Industry, but especially he is president and CEO of the French, German, if I may say so, pharmaceutical company Sanofi. And we are very much looking forward to your thoughts, strategic thinking, how pharmaceutical companies, the industry, the health industry, can achieve what we all want to do, bring the scientific results to the people. Thank you very much for coming. President Barroso, Minister Barr, thank you also, Detlef, for that uh, kind introduction. Distinguished guests, first I'd like to uh, congratulate the organizers. I was here at the very first World, uh, World Health Summit, and uh, it has become so successful that we've had to rely on the foreign minister to provide us with a, a new venue. Um, I don't know what you're going to do next year. We, we may need to go to the United Nations to find a big enough building. <laughs> at these types of events, we have a tendency to, to be focused forward, and that is right. What isn't working? What do we need to do differently? But I think it's also important, because health is so important, that we think about where we have been and the success that has already been achieved. If you look at the last century, multiple studies will tell you that 50% of the dramatic economic growth that was seen in the 20th century was due to better health care and better sanitation. If you look at life expectancy, up significantly. If you look at things like infant mortality, down significantly. This afternoon, I had the honor of participating in a panel on polio. Our company worked with Jonas Salk to help facilitate the production of an inactivated polio vaccine. We later worked with Charles Merieux to actually perfect that vaccine. Today, we are talking on a panel about the end game. We are now able to move to an inactivated polio vaccine because so many countries have made such progress on eliminating polio. We're down to now three countries only where we have polio. This has had a massive impact on human health, but it also has a massive impact on infant mortality. 
And we know when we can reduce infant mortality, we can reduce family size, and where we reduce family size, we can improve economic growth, which creates a positive uh, cycle that allows us to invest in other areas of healthcare. Now, our company developed the, uh, with uh, Jonas Salk this vaccine, but having the vaccine wasn't enough. Having, producing the vaccine doesn't actually get it to a patient. It's only because there was a broad private-public partnership with people like Rotary International, with Gavi, with, with, uh, with, with people like the uh, Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, with the WHO, that we have been able to get this far. So when we look at it, we've made significant progress. And as you've just heard from Aaron, science has never been more exciting, and I have to agree with him on that. And I, and I won't go into to this because he's done this already so, so eloquently. But I will say on a few things, the definition of disease will change. Today, we define diseases by symptoms. Currently, we are now able to define diseases by causes. You may think you have breast cancer today, but that's only because that's where we find the tumor. Tomorrow, we'll actually be able to tell you exactly genetically what that tumor uh, is all about and where it comes from. So we're, in a, we're gonna see more fundamental change in healthcare over the next five to 10 years than we've seen in the last 30. But as you've also heard from previous speakers, we're not out of the woods yet. We face fundamental challenges. The first of this, what we might call chronic diseases, but which I might also refer to as man-made diseases. We are faced with diseases such as type 2 diabetes. 350 million people today suffer from type 2 diabetes. I have I spend most of my life traveling around the world. I have yet to meet a Minister of Health who doesn't tell me that the top three priorities in his or her country are type 2 diabetes, cardiovascular disease, and cancer. And yet we know that all, among those diseases, we can prevent a major, major, a major part of those diseases, even cancer. We have moved now from, as, as one speaker this afternoon said, from malnutrition to obesity without stopping in between. And we're gonna to have to address those problems if we want to improve human health. Also, as we heard also from the President of the European Commission this afternoon, well, there isn't actually even more money to spend on healthcare. How are we going to pay for these new innovations? How are we going to actually uh, be able to provide that greater access in, in poorer countries when money is so tight. Well, one of the things I would hope that we're going to look at in this summit is to think about how do we transform our sick care systems to health care systems? Because, ladies and gentlemen, we don't have health care systems. We mobilize when someone is sick. We put most of our money into treating people when they're already sick. As many patients as we have today who suffer from type 2 diabetes, there is even a greater population of those who suffer from pre-diabetes. We are now seeing type 2 diabetes amongst adolescent um, populations. So how do, we, how do we fix all of this? Well, again, I think the, the most important message is no one organization or institution is going to be able to do this alone. It is only by all of us coming together that we can actually fight these things. We have to think about how we design our societies. We had a, a discussion this afternoon about what can we do to improve better nutrition and, and better uh, levels of activity. If you're in a, in a building today, try to find the staircase if you want to, to take the stairs instead of the elevator. Have we designed our city so that we can facilitate use of bicycles? Are we teaching our children nutrition in schools? All of those things we are all going to have to work on. Yes, we need more innovation. We don't know how to, to treat Alzheimer's disease. With the aging population, this is going to be a tsunami of patients coming at us and costs coming at us if we can't deal with, with Alzheimer's. But this is where we're also going to have to have private-public partnerships. The science today is so much more complex than it was 20, 25 years ago. And you're seeing whole new branches of science coming up. There are new branches of mathematics coming out just because of the subjects like big data and genetics. I can tell you, even though we are one of the largest healthcare companies in the world, 
There's just no way that Sanofi can have all of the different uh, capabilities and competencies in-house to be able to find these cures. It is absolutely essential that we be able to work with universities, with academic institutions, with biotechs, in order to be able to pool all of these competencies. And here I'd like to, to say uh, one of the best examples of private-public partnerships has actually been sponsored by the European Commission. Um, uh, President Barroso already mentioned that. This is the IMI program. A billion euros has been put on the table. I can tell you that Sanofi gets not one euro of that billion euro. The only way that Sanofi can participate in that is that Sanofi also has to put a euro on the table. And the only way that Sanofi can actually qualify, or any other healthcare company, for a program under IMI is that we must work in collaboration. We have to take people out of the silos in science and bring them together. Some of the uh, successes of IMI, we've had five companies come together and share data in an unprecedented way on, against uh, schizophrenia. We have whole new efforts on autism. Today, people are worried about uh, uh, resistant uh, forms uh, of, of infectious disease. Under the IMI program, we have created a whole new consortium looking at in infectious disease. So in order for us to, to, be able to, to be able to participate in those programs, we have had to culturally change how we do things. Five years ago, four years ago, I was here to sign a, an agreement with uh, Pro Professor Einheupel um, with the Charité Hospital. Professor Einhoepel and I did a press conference. The very first question to Professor Einhoepel was, now that you have signed this deal with Sanofi, that means Charity has lost its independence. That was the reaction four or five years ago. Today, the world has moved on. Charité brings to us new competencies, but I would also submit that Sanofi can bring a number of things to Charité. We have scientists from both organizations working side by side in the same labs. Do we have issues to sort out like intellectual property? Yes. Do we have to make sure that transparency is absolutely crystal clear? Yes. Do we have to have ethics oversight? Absolutely. But you cannot solve the world's problems today by staying in silos. And, and this is why programs like the IMI have been so important, because they've not only funded research, they've driven us to work in a different way. Ladies and gentlemen, health care matters to all of us. It is a right. And so I hope that at this conference, looking at how many, uh, how diverse uh, the, the groups are here today, that we can come together, we can solve these healthcare issues, and by the way, if we can do that, we can also create not only better health for people, but also a better economy. Thank you very much, and it's a pleasure to be with you. <clears throat> Ladies and gentlemen, I, I'm sure you agree with me, with leaders in politics, in science, in civil society, and in the private sector, as I've spoken today with their strategic thoughts, we can make a difference and we can achieve more than we do at the present time. And I'm pretty sure all of you go home stimulated by the thoughts which have been deployed tonight from this podium and during the discussions during the day and during the next days following the World Trade Summit. Now this was a lot of food for your brains and of thought and of course as a medical doctor I know you do need some food for your body as well. So uh, if the dramaturgy works well the doors will open and a very simple and modest uh, reception will be prepared for all of you and I wish you a pleasant evening and continued uh, interesting days on the World Trade Summit here in Berlin. Thank you very much.